From the University of Alaska Anchorage, this is Seawolf Voices, a podcast about the pathways to and from education. I'm your host, Matt Jarden. This episode's guest is Vincent Fuelis. Inspired by a particularly impactful guidance counselor he had during his high school years in Olympia, Washington, Vincent knew he wanted to become a counselor. After moving to Wasilla, Vincent began taking classes at UAA through the Matsu College, earning his Associate of Applied Science in Human Services in 2019 with a Bachelor of Human Services on the horizon and plans to continue on to earn a Master of Social Work. Despite the work ahead of him, Vincent isn't waiting to make an impact, founding both Authentic Beginnings, a counseling business specializing in substance misuse and name and gender marker changes, as well as the Queen's Guard, a charity supporting LGBTQ youth. In this episode, Vincent talks about the challenges faced by the LGBTQ community that he's working to address, what led him to pursue human services and social work, and how to create an inclusive environment. Vincent, hello, it's great to have you today on Seawolf Voices. I'm glad to be here. Thank you for the invitation. So I first became acquainted with you and your work after reading news coverage on the Queen's Guard, both from local and national outlets. So let's start there. For our listeners who are unfamiliar, what is the Queen's Guard? The Queen's Guard is a charity organization. It is made up of LGBTQ plus and allies. And our main purpose or the main idea behind our coming together was that we recognize that people in the LGBTQ community need support, especially for our youth. When we look at our youth and we look at the statistics such as substance misuse, suicide, suicidal ideation, there's a very strong correlation there between the amount of support that they receive and how those things come into play in their lives. Kind of the catalyst for forming the Queen's Guard was a personal friend of mine who was a extremely just talented and vivacious trans woman who completed suicide. And when looking at her life and the things that she had shared the most recently with myself and with with other friends, it was easy to see that what had happened was despite how strong she was, I mean, she was a very um, active member of the community. She was there talking about the anti-trans legislation that was going around in, I want to say it was 2017. For as strong as she was, she still felt every single one of the impacts of microaggressions dealt against her as a trans person. And it just, in the end, it became too much and she couldn't fight it anymore. And so she completed suicide. Our goal is to do our part as members of the community to try to buffer that. So we will show up at events uh, such as Drag Queen Storytime, which is where we got started. We've also, we were at Pride for 2019 there in Anchorage, and we act as a positive buffer between the folks who show up at these events and want to yell, scream, use megaphones, whatever their route is to uh, get their message out there that there is something wrong with being who we are and to be positive and be supportive. So a lot of our signs you'll see say things like love is love or um, we are everywhere, things that help raise up um, that positivity that can be found in recognizing that yes, you are just one, but you are one of many in a community. What has the response been like for the Queen's Guard? Well, depending on which side of the fence you are on LGBTQ, we've had a a couple of different responses, well, three different main responses. Uh, One is supportive, happy to see us, events. We've made youth cry happy tears, (laughs) which is always good. We've helped redirect what could be angry youth reaction to a more positive action. On the flip side of that, we've had groups and organizations just utterly ignore us. They will look at us, see us, and take pictures at events, literally leaving out the presence of the Queen's Guard, uh, and then not mentioning us, which is ironic to me. 
yeah, it's just one or the other. But from the community itself, a majority of it has been extremely positive. For example, our very first event was at Drag Queen Storytime at Lusac Library. We showed up with, it was a short notice thing where we found out about it and we had just started getting together. And um, we had 10 folks who were in the Queen's Guard at the time who were able to make it and show up to the event. But we literally had people coming out of the library to come and stand with us. So by the end of the event, there was 30 people. So the support from the community itself, incredible, supportive, amazing. In your experience, have there been openings or opportunities to have a conversation or correct misinformation? If folks are interested in having an open dialogue, every single one of the Queen's Guard members is well-versed and educated or knows someone else in the Queen's Guard that they can say, hey, you know, I don't have this answer to this specific thing, but, but I can take you over here to talk to this person who does. Uh, we are more than willing to have open and honest conversations. I've engaged in several of them. Other members at, at events have also done the same thing, where if people had questions, we'll talk. We don't have a problem with open conversations. And that conversation, that option for that conversation is there until it isn't. Once someone starts blatantly using slurs, makes it apparent that the pretense of the conversation was just an excuse for gaslighting, we're done. Because we know someone who's already entered into this, this conversation in this manner, they don't really have any interest in learning anything or recognizing that maybe there's another side to what they're thinking. It is an interesting thing that you mentioned that one of the things that I've done is had a conversation with someone at an event at Lusac Library, even, where they had questions about, you know, why were we there? Why, what were we protesting at Drag Queen Storytime? And when I explained to them, and again, this was on camera being recorded, that these were the reasons, you know, we look at the suicide rate at 43% that can skyrocket up to over 70% for LGBT young adults and youth, depending on acceptance levels and issues such as corrective rape at the college level. And other statistics like a trans person is more likely than any other LGBTQ youth or LGBTQ plus youth uh, to engage in the use of heroin as a coping mechanism. And so I went through all of these statistics, gave them all of the information, told them where they could find the information to back up what I was saying. Amazingly enough, after that interview, they never talked to us again and our name has never been mentioned. So it's, it's one of those, those things where, yes, we will, we'll have conversations and we'll have those, those hard conversations of, you know, maybe I don't understand why someone chooses to say that or recognizes that they are non-binary as opposed to staying within the binary, but it doesn't mean that we don't support them. And you know, having those kinds of conversations can be difficult. Um, same thing with any gender identity or sexuality. I definitely want to touch more on those statistics as they relate heavily to your degree in ongoing studies. But before I do, like I mentioned earlier, I know you mostly from your work with Queensguard. But outside of that, I've learned that you're also involved with several other groups, such as a small business you operate, Authentic Beginnings, and an inclusive clinic you volunteer at, Full Spectrum Health. Can you tell me a little bit more about those other things you're involved with? Yeah, I am not good at sitting still. Authentic Beginnings is my newest little baby. So with that, what I do is initially it was started so that I could do peer one-to-one -one type counseling support is more the appropriate one for that uh, with helping LGBTQ folks and particularly trans and non-binary folks who want to do name changes or gender marker changes on their ID, walking them through that paperwork. And the interesting thing is, is it feels like it's this huge daunting process to folks. And once you sit down with them and you walk through it, and it takes about 45 minutes, about 45 minutes to an hour, the folks are like, wait, that, that really wasn't that hard. And I'm like, no, the, the hardest part is you, you get to go to court 
and you have to stand up in front of a judge and you have to talk about why you want this. Um, and so there's a little bit of a pep talk about that. It's, it's a simple thing. I'll even help you write something to, to say in front of the judge. So I have like a little script that I, I give them. And so they're really prepared for going in front of the court and being able to say, this is who I am. This is why I want a name change. Oh, and it makes me happy. So you should let me do this. And trying to make it as accessible as possible to folks, going over some additional forms that they may not be aware of. Like a lot of folks think they cannot get their name change done because they don't have the money for it. And here in the state of Alaska, there's actually a fee waiver form. And so that fee could be waived. Uh, you just have to be willing to fill in all of your financial information. I'm also currently expanding out authentic beginnings from that process to, and here's where it comes back to all of my schooling, to working with uh, substance misuse and recognizing that, again, in the LGBTQ community, we have slightly different needs than in the cis-het population um, or cisgender heterosexual populations. There is a difference in what's needed for sexual, you know, safe sex education and bringing that into the discussion of, okay, if you're, if you're misusing the substance, are you safe? What are you doing to be safe? So that's where I'm heading with that. I'm actually officially taking clients starting today. So if someone you know or someone you love needs a little help and they need something from someone who is a part of the community and isn't going to judge, and I think that's one of the biggest concerns in our community is why go to AA or any of these other organizations when there is that concern and fear that it's all going to be judged and it's not going to be helpful about the substance abuse when I'm so focused on being myself at these types of things. So that's, that's the next thing. Um, I am still working with Full Spectrum Health. Uh, full Spectrum Health is in the process, though, of switching over clients and patients to identity because identity is actually taking it over so that it can be a nonprofit organization, which allows them a greater ability to, to really serve our community because they can accept a greater variety of patients more easily because of insurance. They can do sliding scale fees. And here again, we go back to this is community supporting community. So I'm looking forward to seeing how that goes and seeing where that ends up and how, how great it can really become. What inspired you to pursue human services as a major? So many things. Many, many, many years ago, when I was but a wee lad, <laughs> Um, I was fortunate enough that uh, when I was in high school, my high school counselor was this very incredible woman, very, very sweet, lived, uh, she commuted from Seattle, Washington down to Olympia, Washington every day to be a, a high school counselor. Um, she lived in Seattle with her partner of many, many years and her son. So all of a sudden I had a lesbian counselor who was able to be supportive and talk about the things that I needed to be able to talk about. And it was this huge sense of relief off of my shoulders to know that I could just go and talk to her. That was kind of the part where I started thinking, you know, maybe when I grow up, I wanna be a counselor. I wanna do something. One of my goals in, in life is that I know that I can't change the world and changing the world from Alaska would be very difficult anyways. But if there is something I could do that at least makes my little corner of the world a better place, then that's what I want to do. And it just made sense and felt right to be able to go into human services. It's such a varied collection of different things that you can be involved in and be helping people 
You know, you can go into substance misuse, like what I am doing currently. You can follow it up with a, um, here at UAA, you can switch it over to a master's of social work, which then opens it up in an even larger way, which is what I'm hoping to do after I graduate this fall. You can get into management, you can get into human services or human resources at companies, you can get into case management. There is so many things that human services opens up for you that you would be able to do. And it seemed like a great place to get into for a degree and figure out which direction I really wanted to go to. I still want to do counseling, obviously. And for me, I'm starting out with the uh, substance misuse, and then hopefully I'll finish up my master's with a master's of social work, and then I can sit for uh, my license, my LCSW license, and that'll open up more counseling options for me as well. And with where we are in the world right now, COVID has definitely increased issues with mental health and concerns with mental health. And for the LGBTQ population, it impacts us in some ways even more. And I know I'm kind of diverging a little bit from your, your question, but how that, that works is that for the LGBTQ folks, where we find the majority of our support is in our friends and our chosen family. With COVID, we didn't have that connectedness there. So a lot of folks are dealing with uh, even greater risks of suicidal ideation, greater risks of chemical dependency, uh, substance misuse in general, abusive relationships, whether that be with their, in their home, with their families. And so I decided that that needed to be kind of become a priority for right now. But we do see that lack of connectedness and how it has hurt people. Um, there's actually already studies coming out talking about that uh, and then looking at how minority status within one minority group to, so you've got your majority of LGBTQ people, but then your trans folks are a minority within that minority group. And then when you start adding in trans folks who are also uh, BIPOC, then you've got an even greater issue of a minority, it's, uh, minority stress comes into play. And so that connectedness becomes even more important for them as well. And so trying to rebuild all of that and find healthy ways to do it instead of everybody just running out to the bar and look, we can all party again. Um, yeah. <laughs> It's funny, you mentioned diverging from my original question when you actually perfectly segued into my next question. So you already earned your human services associate degree and a chemical dependency technician certificate. So can you talk a little bit about what's next for you, both in terms of school and your career? I'm hoping um, I've got a, a supervisor. So when you get your chemical dependency or sorry, it's actually considered a counselor technician certification but it's specific for chemical dependency according to the state. And so with that, to go from a counselor technician, you have to have someone who supervises you for a hundred hours in these very specific little things that you talk about uh, for areas. And then um, you have to get in 2000 hours of actual work time. So that work time can include time with patients, paperwork, figuring out, how to create the perfect assessment for your company, whatever it is. So you've got to get those 2000 hours in. From there, then you become a chemical dependency counselor tier one. There's tier two and then there's supervisor, but to be honest, my goal is to get to that tier one. I'm not interested necessarily in supervising other people. I'm more of a boots on the ground type person. At least for right now, uh, my goal is to get to that tier one and get my official counselor letters after my name for finishing up my bachelor's degree. Gosh, that's that's been some time, <laughs> but I, it's it's been great. 
the professors at UAA have been incredible. And I'll come up with some off the wall, random questions that are just like, okay, well, we've talked about this, but what about this? And they're always happy to see those questions, I think, and to come up with the answers and, and find the answers. So I'm kind of sad to be leaving those classes behind, but getting that bachelor degree and then moving on to the master's of social work, which um, again, I'll be applying here at UAA for that as soon as I can get into do the application because I believe it's not open until this fall, later on this fall, might even be January. And then just working on my master's of social work and getting through that. Uh, that is a two to four year program, depending on how many classes you take. And uh, of course, the practicum involved in that is pretty intense because you, you have, I want to say it was 250 hours a semester to get in. That's going to be pretty intense on top of the other hours that I'm doing, but I have a schedule plan, so it will be okay. Once I have that, the goal is for uh, sitting for my LCSW and getting that licensing done. And um, once I have that, I want to open up my practice. Right now, I'm looking at working with just folks who are 18 and older. Of course, the reasons behind that are there's so much more that goes into working with teenagers and middle schoolers and young, you know, our, our youth. And I want to make sure that I have the education and I have the experience and I've, I've put in what I need to put in and learned what I need to learn to work with folks in those age ranges. Um, of course, a small portion of that might also be that the insurance is extremely high for doing that, which I get. So that's the goal for there. And then of course, because I don't have enough on my plate, my wife is looking at potentially retiring after next year. Uh, she's a school teacher. And one of the things that we have been talking about doing is opening up a combination art studio with a coffee shop out here in the valley and having it be open later on in the evening so that college students or teenagers needing a place to study would have a safe place to go and of course it's going to have a great big old rainbow on it somewhere uh with opening that up it would also give me a space for having my own office built into the coffee shop because well people go to get coffee doesn't mean they're there just that they're there just to see me so Kind of helping to normalize the idea of getting uh, counseling while getting something as simple as a cup of coffee or drawing a picture. How did you come to choose UAA? For me, as great as high school was, I had transferred high schools at one point at my last uh, year and a half of school, and there was one class that I needed to graduate with my diploma. And the counselor at the new high school didn't think it was important to tell me that. So I didn't take that class. So I ended up not, not graduating. And of course, being young and 18 and frustrated enough, I just said, well, what do I need a high school diploma for anyways? Mm -hmm. So then I turned around and I got my GED. And then I just worked a lot. And from working and traveling around the US, then ending up here in 2008 uh, in Fairbanks for a little bit. I had the opportunity through my work to have college tuition covered. And so I figured, eh, I'll, I'll go take a class. We'll check it out. We at work, um, I was working retail customer service and we had a very large portion of our clients who would come in who were Spanish speaking. So I thought, well, okay, where, where can I go to take a Spanish class? And somebody said, well, UAF is right here. So I took a Spanish class at UAF and okay, well, that was fun. Went back to working more again and then uh, ended up moving here uh, in 2016. And while I was looking for a job, I started looking around and thinking, you know, if I'm ever going to do this, being a counselor and, and doing something here, I need to get started on this. 
And I looked around and while UAA is a great option, it was all the way in Anchorage and I'm out in the valley and I drive a pickup truck. <laughs> so uh, that was not the best option actually. Um, so I started out at Matsu. And so I finished up at Matsu, got my associate's degree there, and then continued on working towards my bachelor's degree. I looked at other schools and other options, but I had really enjoyed my experiences with the professors that I'd encountered at Matsu. And when I was looking at the classes for the bachelor's degree, a lot of those professors teach some for the bachelor's degree too. And I'm like, well, I like these professors, so let's give it a try. And so some of the classes I have had are still at Matsu, but a majority of them are now actually through the Anchorage campus with professors I've gotten to know there. So that's how I got to Anchorage, to UAA. But what's really kept me there, honestly, is those same professors. A lot of these other schools want to be all promoting the idea. We've got professors who actually do this as, as their profession. This is what they do and on and on with that. But UAA has this also. And so being able to talk to Dr. Chase or uh, Professor Paterna and be like, hey, I, I have this question. And it's not necessarily to do with the class, but something you know, somehow related to the subject. And they know the answer because this is what they do. And they're willing to actually educate you. That makes a huge difference in where you go. And these are people that I can send an email to and I get a response back. Or with COVID, I can call them and they answer their phone. My wife was looking at classes and was looking into doing a school counselor. And she went through an online program because it would fit her schedule better. She doesn't get, or didn't, I should say, didn't get the same kind of quality that I get here at UAA. Just the difference in professionalism that I get here. I'm, yeah, you're stuck with me here. So if any of my professors or future professors listen to this, yeah, you're stuck with me. What are some important considerations to make when trying to create an LGBTQ inclusive environment? There's two things that go into that, to answering that question. Are you creating the space as a person who is LGBTQ or are you creating it as an ally? Because it's two very different approaches. If you're creating it as an ally, which is where a lot of spaces and a lot of folks, uh, at least that I'm interacting with currently, say, I want to do something to show that I am supportive. The biggest thing to remember is ally is a verb. It's not a noun, it's a verb. And you can sit there and, and, and I've, I've heard this in other ways from other folks, from other minority organizations, or uh, not organizations, but or, uh, minority groups, is that people will pull the ally card sometimes. And it's, do you know how much I have done for you people? And this is not being an ally. This is using what you have done to try and get something from us. This, this doesn't help. The biggest thing is to just create. And when you have questions, research. You know, Do as much research as you can on your own. If you are struggling and you can say, look, I tried to find the best way to make it easy for folks to know that this is a safe space, but I'm having a hard time getting the word out. How do I do that? talk to a group of folks who are in the LGBTQ community, network, network with other organizations. Um, Choosing Our Roots is an amazing organization here in uh, Alaska, and they have helped us as far as the Queens Guard quite a bit. So has Identity. We're working on forging more connections with other organizations, but it's that networking. And whether you're an LGBTQ person or an ally, you have to have those networks. Otherwise, you're floating out there by yourself alone. For as much as we want to focus on LGBTQ plus needs, we're still a minority group. And so there can be too many organizations that deplete what is around. 
uh, as far as donations and financial support, sponsorships, that is a very finite thing. There, there is a limit to how much people in communities will give or can give. And so by networking, you're able to find out, are you duplicating the same thing that someone else is already doing? Is your energy better spent in helping promote what is already there? Or is there something really wrong with what's there and you need to create your own for some reason? So that's something to really evaluate. But if you look and you find that there is another organization that's doing the same thing or that can somehow benefit and help with what you want to do, use that. Because then it becomes something even better for the community itself. Vincent, it was such a pleasure chatting with you today. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you very much. Seawolf Voices is a production of the University of Alaska Anchorage Office of Advancement and Alumni Relations.